So let me introduce the next session about um, how to transform finance with real practitioners uh, sharing their experience. Uh, and let me introduce Aparna, who is moderating the session. Aparna is a partner with BCGX. She's been practicing AI for the past 15 years. Uh, and it's really my pleasure to have her moderate this panel. Welcome, Aparna. Thanks, Shini, for, and, uh, for the amazing session on generative AI and love the insights from the report. Um, as a follow-up, we'll be talking about how AI is playing a pivotal role in reshaping financial services. With me today, I have uh, Matthew Driver, who's an EVP and head of services at MasterCard Asia Pacific. I also have Dr. Yao, who's a group CDO at FWD, and Geraldine Wong, who's also a group CDO at um, GXS, which is the Singtel Grab Digibank Consortium. Um, so we'll be delving into use cases, applications. I would love to understand perspectives from the practitioners. I'll start with you, Dr. Yao. Uh, we heard a lot of use cases. Um, you know, Stini spoke, spoke about the entire use case roadmap. We have heard a lot about how AI is used for combating risk, fraud, and improving the customer services. What have you seen in your journey so far on where AI applications are able to create real value? Okay, um, good afternoon everyone. I'm very glad to join the panel discussion to share some of the point of view and also experience from the activity. Okay, uh, talk about the fraud. I think fraud definitely is a very critical uh, use case to use AI, whatever the predicted AI and also the generative AI. So in the insurance industry, there are, there are some of the key use cases. I think we need to use leverage AI to have a better risk estimation and also assessment. For example, the underwriting uh, claims and also some of the misconducts. So for, for to support use case, there are many AI technology we can use. First one, you can use the OCR, right, to extract the information from the receipt, from the invoice, from the documents, right? Then you can extract the right information, right, and from the structure, uh, from unstructure to the structure. Secondly, you also you can use the pretty AI for that particular claim underwritings. Can we come up with a risk assessment score for that? So then you're ready to provide like an instant approval right, experience to the, uh, to, the, to the customers. At the same time, we also use, can use the generative AI to summarize the documentation. Typically for those uh, complicated uh, underwriting case, there's some a part of the medical report, right? So we need to some, we need to extract the data, summarize the data, then generate like a smart worksheet for the underwriting officer to review, then to then for that improve their productivity to review this uh, complicated case. And definitely, cost center is another big area. I think it's uh, a lot of companies using stuff on chat chat for us. Now it's about uh, companies that use the digital humans that to provide uh, 24 plus seven. Uh, uh, experience uh, to really to provide a service uh, to the customers. Thank you. Thanks, Rokio. Matthew, um, what are some of the promising applications that you have seen? Um, you've been in the uh, in this area for the last two decades almost. Well, thanks for being complimentary. And only two decades. I feel a lot younger today, so that's great. But good to see everybody. Uh, look, I think that where we've been applying AI, you know, really 10 plus years has been primarily in, in fraud detection, right? So whether or not that's network intrusion, whether or not that's sort of looking at monitoring, you know, different points on our, on our network, etc. So we sort of started with, with fraud that remains, you know, primarily the, the space where we see the, the greatest value identification for us. Um, you know, naturally we're also looking on the cyber because... Um, the cyber side because of, with, it's a tool that we use in our fusion center to make sure that we're you know, protecting our network as well as protecting our customers. I think where we're moving now is we've moved into other applications, so financial forecasting, where we've, we've found that AI is pr you know, proving to be pretty reliable, network monitoring, just looking at our, our network points across the world and you know, really predicting where we may see um, you know, a 
I guess, deterioration in performance of how do we get out our network engineers out across our, our business to make sure that it's working there. And then naturally on the personalization side. So that's where we're starting to move now, thinking about contextual um, commerce applications for um, loyalty and, and things like that. But predominantly still, you know, where we're looking, generative AI for us is, you know, the, the, the next step on the fraud side, there's been something we've been doing for three years, uh, where we're really looking now for, you know, why is an LLM model, you know, useful? I mean, essentially it's learning the language of transactions in many respects, right? So that's what we're really trying to do next is what is a, what does a good transaction look like? How do we get ahead of that? And then secondly, really it's in the synthetic fraud area where what we want to be able to do is get better at detecting on edge cases. So when you've got, you know, extremely high volume but very um, low incidence specific use cases, we find that you know, AI can be super helpful just trying to help us build a model overlay to detect an edge case. Now, it becomes a bit retrospective. We know that you know, we're looking to fine tune our models all the time, but there's a huge level of precision that we're getting out of running our AI models to, to develop um, an overlay for a specific use case that may may have an incidence in, you know, the, the I guess, the, the tens of billions. So that's sort of where we're trying to get the greatest precision right now. Thanks. Uh, moving on to more emerging domains, so to speak. Dr. Geraldine, uh, how are you seeing a Digibank, uh, you know, benefiting from AI? How is AI shaping customer experiences in FinTech and Digibank? So comparatively, I think behind giants like them, we don't have as much resources. Um, and all the more we have to leverage on data technology, even ecosystem data like Singtel and Grab data as well. So at GXS, we actually, uh, our vision is to, to build a customer-centric bank to really un uh, meet the unmet needs and pain points of, of customers today by harnessing the full potential of data and technology. And, and how does this being manifested is in providing tiered customer pricing to our flexi loan customers as well. So today we have two uh, products. One is a savings loan, savings product, and one is a flexi loan product. And this is customized to the needs of customers based on the data that they have provided to us through consent, um, through Grab and Singtel. And this we give through tiered customer pricing. And we have seen actually a great promising results based on maximizing yeah, utilization as well as profits as well. Um, the second use case that we have looked at is about improving customer onboarding experiences. And, and we know how long it takes um, with name screening and customer onboarding. Um, and, and we do not have an army of people to look through manual, through manual interventions. So that's also where AI plays a part in trying to reduce some of this manual um, work to, Walk through processing as well. And then we have seen that this is half the amount of time that's taken for, for someone to onboard. Thank you. Uh, when we talk about these use cases and applications, uh, what I've often seen is that most companies stay at the POC stage, uh, proof of concept stage, and they struggle to scale. What are some of the success factors that you've seen that has helped you scale these applications to get real value? Uh, Dr. Yao, maybe uh, you can share. Okay, our experience to make AI scale, I think uh, maybe three areas I'd like to share with you. The first one, I think we need to build a strong foundation of that. Right? Not, uh, without data, I think cannot, we can, we can, the AI capability is quite limited. So we need to build a strong data foundation with the real-time data stream capability and really to can support the real-time for detections. Secondly, you need to consolidate data from different systems, whatever structure, data and structure, then really to make AI more smart or more, and more accurate. The third thing is also you need to have the machining ops uh, or whatever the process and tools and to enable the data scientists to, to build the model, to train the model, to validate the model, and to deploy the model quickly. And also, in a regular basis, to monitor the model performance and refine and so forth. So the foundation is the key to make AI at the scale. Secondly, I think it's the, the business strategy. You need to embed AI into the business process, into the, the business systems. So within FWD, we have a, a strategy we call smart insurance. So our, our objective is to embed AI along the customer journey our distribution journey and also our employee journey to see what kind of uh, uh, how, how and back everywhere. But definitely the journey to achieve that, that's the vision we want to do. So to support that, we have our 
uh, business KPI. So this is a shared KPI between the data team and also the, the business team together to have a common goal. So then really embed AI to support the, the, the real business case that really can generate the business value, value for that. So the business adoption, business KPI, and also the strategy, I think is also important, make AI scale. And last but not least, I think just now we'll talk about response AI. I believe the data science team and data team are very skilled and compliant environment also is very important. So they are more free to build different models and within the skill and also with the, the, the also the compliant environment, right? Then they don't have to worry about data privacy, the, 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 the uh, more AI model bias and technical things. But definitely we have a process manager so that free them to build different models. So that's some of the key lessons learning. Really to help you to transform from the POC stage to be on more like the AI stage stage. Thank you. Geraldine, anything from your side? Because I know that you all had to jumpstart AI and quickly scale as Digibank came to life. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll start with three points. And echoing what Dr. Yao has said, um, having the strategy aligned to the organizational strategy is so important. And I'm glad that even for us as a data strategy, it's about strengthening customer relationships while fostering customer trust and also having that strong risk management framework within the, the organization. And this strongly aligns to what um, the bank sees it as well as one of their organizational goals. The other thing is about having clear matrix of value that the, the, the project brings. It shouldn't stay at a sandbox level, it shouldn't stay at an experimental level, but enterprise-wide adoption. And this requires the buy-in all the way from the board level as well, all the well, where, way to the working level. The second point I wanted to bring up was earlier, I think Dr. Stein was mentioning about the roles of people and talent that has to evolve along the way. She called out four cohorts as well. And, and this is so true because having to invest in the right talent at different, level, different, AI, different parts of your AI journey is so important. And for an organization, you need to be able to recognize which part of the journey or which part of the AI maturity curve are you on, what are the right talent that's needed for that part of your journey as well. Um, and also understanding what are the trends that are coming up to be able to upskill, reskill your talent to, to work with the right platform. Dr. Yao mentioned ML Ops as well. How are we getting ML engineers? In future, there will be LLM Ops. Are our ML Ops engineers equipped for LLM Ops? What are the skills that are needed? And I think the third point um, I wanted to expand on Dr. Yao's point on data and technology was establishing the right data quality, data la labeling, metadata standards, and, and right sets of data. As we move towards fine-tuning our LLMs, we need the right type of data, the right quality of data, proper data quality to be able to fine-tune those models um, if you're considering to build your own foundational models in-house. Thanks, Geraldine. Um, we spoke about the success factors. Um, important to also discuss the challenges that you will have faced in the journey. So, Matthew, question to you. Uh, what are some of the barriers to adoption or scaling that you have seen, um, you know, in the journey? Yeah, look, I think it's, the points have been made pretty well already. I think that, you know, if from a, a pure kind of machine learning um, application that would sit in a fraud space. I mean, that's something we're very comfortable with. We've been doing it for years, so I think there's a natural kind of process for it to happen. I think in other areas, we then need to, I, I guess like many of the trends that we've talked about in over the years at, at this festival, the, the biggest challenge is just getting um, broad awareness. So I think one is um, just how do you have access to the right workbench tools, the right technology to be able to leverage this? Second, I mean, we've you know, just just simply ensuring that your your developers or your um, you know, the data scientists have the right access to the right tools in the right way in the right environment. Compliance doesn't like necessarily some of the tools that they want to have access to. So how do you make the access to those tools available? I think as we move into more of the the LLM applications, what you're seeing is that. AI application goes out of what is a specialist kind of AI garage application where I've, you know, I've got my you know, data scientist in our garage sitting in a certain place and they get value from having you know, 200 of them together um, in, a, in a team. So actually now, more broadly, I've got consulting access, um, the loyalty teams, etc. They have to get much more familiar with the tools. So I think that it's sort of... The, the next step to really getting broader adoption, like most new technologies, is a baselining of skill sets. 
So one, you need to get the strategy adoption. Two, you need to make sure that senior management and you know, your board structure have got a good understanding of you know, what the implications are of this technology for your business and the spaces that management want to go into. Then you need to make sure that you've got um, a clear allocation of responsibility because one of the things that comes up with AI is there's so, well, particularly with generative AI, is there's so many different application spaces that it's natural for people to go, oh, okay, I'll take this, I'll take this, I'll take this, and then there's no real clear strategy as to how you want to apply it. So I think that all those component parts needs to come together. And then certainly just thinking about you've got the fundamental piece about garbage in, garbage out. And I think that that's a critical point that I guess has already been hinted at at this point in time is to say that if you're using your own private data, um, I think that's where you naturally want to start. Um, and I think that that, that role creates its own, you know, in, in your own data environment, it, it's, it's a safer place. But w as was indicated earlier on, I think you've also got to get the education that's out there to understand what are the right use cases to get into, right? Whether or not it's fraud, whether or not it's credit, whether it's personalization, whether it is, you know, the intelligent assistant sort of stuff that our um, product guys are demonstrating um, here today. It's a very different space. And so I think that it's about, there's a, there's a natural need for everybody to get a certain base level of understanding. And I think that to me is the biggest challenge. Because if you're going to scale in these new spaces, you need to be very, very thoughtful about how you build capability because the, the key is that you need the AI, but you need the human in the loop. And I think how you, how you kind of orchestrate that is going to be key. Thanks, Matthew. The rate of uh, progress here is indeed fascinating, both in traditional AI and now more recently with Gen AI. Um, as with any new technology, it obviously introduces more risks into the system. So if we talk about, you know, regulations, and it is always said that regulations are catching up with technology, technology moves faster. Um, what is your view, Matthew, on uh, what are the implications, some of the implications on um, how the space on AI policies and regulations is evolving? Yes, it's a very good question. I think that, look, I think at the end of the day, we're going to see it. There's a desire for regulation. I think there's a, a natural kind of um, concern for some very well-documented potential bad circumstances, right? And I think we're all talking about AI for, for good in general, but we're talking about you know, financial services. I think we all you know, have exposure to AI or personalization every day. Right, if we're looking at my Spotify account and all of a sudden now I've got my um, you know, AI DJ, right? Um, because when my family listens to the same account, I always get exposed to what I claim is bad music from you know, somebody in my family, right? But the reality is that I've already given kind of the permission and the risk of you know, my bad disco playlist being exposed to somebody in, the, in, in my household is relatively low. Right? Sure. One of my kids might get embarrassed, but that's okay. I mean, it's my job to embarrass him, right? But then on the other side, you know, if you're going into financial data, um, there's much more of a downside. So naturally, you see this adjustment on regulation, which needs to be kind of risk proportionate. You know, think about health data that goes to another area. You think about security data goes to another level. So you can't be in a situation and argue, okay, no, you. You, you can't really have a no-risk situation. You need to recognize the trade-off, but you also need to have this sort of proportionate ability to calibrate the risk so you've kind of got the, 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 the data controls and the, and the pieces that you need, but also recognizing where you need to lean in more. So I think we're seeing a general desire to kind of have a framework that's out there. Are they going to be as consistent as we want? Probably not. But I do think we want to make sure that you've got future forward regulation that is recognizing that this is going to be a dynamic process and that you, in a situation where you don't want to be playing catch up, right? And so, you know, Sunak and we just had the, the AI kind of sessions in the UK, was able to get kind of 28 folks to kind of come together and say, look, we want to agree on a framework. So I think there is a desire to have that there. Um, it's not going to be easy, but I think the analogy that I would have is that, you know, air travel, a lot of people came here 
um, flying into Singapore. Um, the reality is that you know this industry started to boom really, you know, 60s, 70s, maybe really 80s, and we've all managed to agree a global framework for air traffic, right? And air standards and air safety. Now it's not quite the same thing, but I do think there's a desire for us to have a kind of a broad framework that's going to be you know consistent. But we'll have to evolve over time to reflect this environment. So I, that's sort of where, where I come from on this. I think it's going to be, you have to have engagement between industry and government. I think that obviously goes without question. There are naturally, particularly as we've gone into LLM, concerns on copyright, concerns on cyber security, concerns on you know, hallucination, etc. And so thinking about how you create the right kind of I guess, dynamic, but, but also um, forward-looking framework is going to be critically important. Thanks, Matthew. Dr. Yao, keen to know from you, how is insurance industry responding to these developments? And especially, you know, in the era where customer trust is pivotal, um, how are we taking care of, you know, data security and privacy as well? Yeah. I think Matthew just covered quite a lot of the topics. I just uh, supplemented some of the... Um, uh, in some of the uh, control on this area. I think yesterday I was in the Microsoft uh, on the AI consoles. The Microsoft also arranged a workshop, sim similar workshop with the uh, regulators. I think one of the comments, I'm not saying conclusion, is quite interesting. I think because we all believe that general AI is still new to us. I right? just, just launched last November, so just only one year only. Whatever from the regulator side, from the, our uh, insurance or finance, the company side, still new. I think it's, uh, uh, our strategy, I think, is first of all, we need to proactively embrace the generative AI. Is it, we do believe that will really are game changing for our, our industry. At the same time, we also need to proactively to manage the, uh, the risk. I'm just now glad to see some of the guiding principle is quite, quite aligned with us. Uh, hopefully, I think we want to align with regulator, with the, some of the business consultant, and also our, our, our peer company to see some of the common principle as an industry we should follow that, so like a transparency, accountable, and uh, uh, accurate, and so forth. It's a message as I already mentioned. At the same time, we also come up with in implementations, right? Instead of do, to set up a policy, we also have the guidelines and also the tools to control that the AI modeling, whether for the modeling life cycle or the usage of the general AI, to, to monitor that, right? To see is any, uh, any bias, is any authentic issues, and whether the data quality, as John mentioned, has some issues. There are those areas, I think, different rules should take the accountability to see how we manage the risk uh, um, properly. So, at the same time, also working with the, uh, also the, 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 some of the uh, suppliers, like Microsoft, other companies, to come up with some of the tools to help us to more effectively and systematically to monitor the, the risk. So, this is some of the uh, learning I'd like to share with you. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Yeah. Geraldine, how do you see the role of responsible AI in managing some of these risks, especially in DigiBank? Um, so I see it in three ways, right? And I, I do think that we, we, as mentioned earlier by the two gentlemen, clear accountability framework, potentially, if possible, universal governance uh, frameworks. Um, it will ensure a good balance of human oversight um, versus, uh, within the AI life cycle as well. Um, I think the second point, I think, is about establishing standards, hopefully universal as well, to ensure that some of the systems, or most of the systems, will be like what Dr. Yao said, uh, transparent um, and have such fairness as well. And, and I think a good um, starting point was our Veritas framework. There was a toolkit, there was assessments provided by that, which most financial institutions actually leverage on. And I think the third part is about how do we capture human actions um, in rectifying, and decisions as well, in rectifying some of the errors that the AI systems currently produce. And this should be a feedback mechanism that, that um, the AI system should learn from as well and identify new potential risks that it may introduce in future. Thanks, Shirley. Um, you know, talking about generative AI and hybrid intelligence, uh, Dr. Yao, how do you see the roles of humans evolving specifically in the era of virtual assistants and chatbots? That's a good question. Uh, I used the car uh, history as, a, as an example, right? A hundred years ago, when the new car right, and introduced or, uh, or built, uh, some of the people that in the past is the horse and rider, right? They are worried, right? They are they're worried to lose the job. Actually, they lose the job. Right? They create a new job for the, for the cars. 
But now in the past few years, you know, China, the electric cars uh, is, uh, is another innovation. Now it's all the all engines, electric, right? It's, it's also different the landscape. So that's why some of the jobs may be missing, but a new job also coming. So the similar concept, I feel it could be similar, ap applicable for the AI. So yeah, I think it's, we need to embrace AI at the same time as a human being, as, and, and also to see how to leverage AI to, to make your job more productivity or create new jobs for that. So this is one angle. A another thing is, I think for some of the complicated cases I just mentioned, uh, and uh, for example, underwriting or claim, some complex cases, we still need a human to involve. Right? The AI engine can give you uh, some uh, pre-screening, pre pre some assessment, but end up with still the people to make a decision. Because AI can be created by us. Depends what kind of models, depending on attributes using. So we have to leverage the human to make a, a more balanced decision on that. So at the end of the day, maybe 80% leverage AI to give you, uh, I make the job easier. At the same time, still 20%. That's a key decision. Human being can play the role. So that's, that's my point of view. Thank you. Thanks, Rupiah. Shina spoke, also spoke about you know, uh, the roles and how the talent is evolving and different cohorts, AI shapers, builders, and all. Generally, I'm keen to know what are some of the considerations or implications you are seeing, uh, especially on your talent strategy, ways of working, and operating model. I think in the short term, um, the key is about create, finding creative solutions, finding the pain points within the domain that you work in to apply some of these uh, emerging technologies. However, in the longer term, uh, it's, I do foresee a compression or, or flat, flattening of job layers, right? And actually, I'm a little bit more concerned on the entry-level jobs. I'll take a controversial view here on, on entry-level jobs and how they are going to be trained for the future as well. How are we building a pipeline of, of senior leaders if there's going to be fewer and funnel is going to be sm smaller from, from an entry-level jobs point of view if some of these emerging technologies are going to help with some of the current work. So we really need to rethink how are we augmenting some of this technology with entry-level jobs. Thanks, Geraldine. Um, that is a very pragmatic perspective. And thank you all for sharing such deep insights on you know, the use cases, um, how the regulation and technology is balancing each other, as well as the talent ways of working and all. Uh, before we wrap up, very keen to know, in your mind, how do you see the space evolving in the next five to 10 years? I know it's hard to predict given the recent developments, uh, but let's start with you, Matthew. Okay, um, Bill Gates said, you know, made the observation, right? We tend to overestimate change in two years and underestimate over 10 years. I think I'm going to obviously underestimate, but I think there's going to be a massive change um, in the way people work. Um, I don't necessarily, and I, and I actually think it's sort of, and I'm pretty optimistic in terms of the, the value it takes. I think it will take a new skill set because we're going to be in a situation where knowledge work, is going to be really high value, and it's like look, today, generative AI at its baseline is like having a smart but naive assistant, right? So you need to have you know the guidance in in the process, and I and I do think that that creates look challenges for the way people will work currently, but I think we'll adjust quite quickly. It will mean jobs will change. Uh, but I'm, I'm completely um, with the the argument from Dr. Gal that it's just going to be a, it's going to be a repurposing. I don't think we're all going to be lying on a beach just having age and banking happening. At the same time, look, I think that the, the, the reality is that we're going to go to this sort of um, boss-enabled technology, right? You're going to have delegated authorization. You're going to have a digital twin of some kind. Am I, going to, am I okay with maybe having my um, refrigerator being, you know, monitoring my, my you know, yogurt and milk consumption so when I'm out on a business trip, and my, you know, my wife's doing her um, board you know, sessions in, in Africa that it orders things so it's there when I get back. I have no problem with that, right? So I think that we're going to find this delegated authority. I think it's going to be a very big change in the sense that how that you have that transformational situation where you've got a AI-powered um, potential, you know, avatar if you like, or agent or series of agents on delegated authority acting on your behalf doing stuff. And it's quite hard for me to think how much change that that could create, but I certainly know in Singapore we have some advantages because it's a very efficient place. At the same time, I can see that 
that's going to simplify my life quite significantly, whether it's travel, whether it's finance, whether it's all those things. I think but what it comes back to is the only way that I'm going to be successful or going to want to be able to do that is if I trust the system. And I think coming back to the role of data and data responsibility, ethical AI, but having the governance structures, it's up to us to ensure that we have those in place. If we have those in place and we can build trust in that system, we'll create much more transformation of change than we will if we don't. Yeah? To simply mention Matthew, I want to cite one of the comments from our, uh, our group CEO uh, mentioned last week. He, he mentioned this, I think, when the PC introduced, same thing people worry about those jobs. Today, no one will join a company without PCs. <laughs> PCs become a, one of the part of your job life, right? And same, I think in the next five to ten years, I think AI will be part of your working life, also same for your, for your, for your real life also, like a mobile. So I, I think it's AI become one of the key tools. I, I no one would, would join a company without AI uh, support. Like, you can see uh, Microsoft launched the uh, core palette. I think we are, I do believe uh, many, many industries come out to, they were, they were designed and also to launch the different core palettes and make different roles more productive and more, uh, yeah, more efficient, efficient on that. Yes. I think I see it in two ways. Um, one, increasing democratization of, of services. What used to be unavailable for the big masses um, would be democratized across the big masses. The second is thinking about how Gen, Gen AI or AI in general will change how we search for information. And if you think back to how we search for information, it's all through SEOs, right? Um, if this is being changed right now, then how do we find those information? Is SEO still going to be relevant in this, in this space? Um, so the way we advertise, the way we market, the way we engage with our consumers might change as well. Um, and so we need, really need to think about also how we do our product creation, our feature design, and in capturing this change. Thank you all. Very interesting insights, and thanks for sharing your perspectives and war stories. Have a great day ahead. Thank you.